Okay, thank you very much. I am Yoko Shinpuku. I'm the Vice President of International Public Relations in Hiroshima University. Today, I'm going to talk about what we do for the international public relations. I'd like to introduce a little bit of myself. I was appointed as the Vice President of International Public Relations this year, but I'm not originally from the field of public relations. Sorry, a... uh, Shimpuk-san, yes? we, are, we are seeing your slides and the slides note now. Can you shift it? Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I, so I'm not originally from the field of public relations. I'm a professor in global health nursing, and I've been a member of an international science organization called Global Young Academy. Serving as the executive committee of the Global Young Academy, I've been giving a talk at international conferences and meetings, including UN International Day of Women and Girls in Science, UN General Assembly Science Summit, IAP General Assembly, AAAS, SDS Forum, and so forth. I've been publicly speaking from the perspective of young scientists, and I'm still learning about international PR, so I'm looking forward to exchanging ideas and learning more about international PR today. So about Hiroshima University, founded in 1949, Hiroshima University is a comprehensive research university with 12 undergraduate and four graduate schools. We are one of the 13 universities selected as Super Global University, top type by Japan's Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. Next. From the devastating history of the atomic bomb, the university rose to fulfill a mission of peace. In 2022, the impact rankings, Hiroshima University was ranked among the top 100 in the world for five out of 17 SDG categories. In August 2022, in cooperation with Arizona State University, we opened the first international branch of Bowling University inside our campus, the first Japanese national university to do so. So we are highly open to new opportunities, especially for international exchanges. Currently, I'm working with a leader, Obata-san, and three members, Hayashi-san, Araki-san, and Matsudawa-san for international public relations. And the, uh, we are doing uh, the following things. Uh, there are four ways we get research results to write about. The first one is HU Update. We publish an online news magazine three times a year. To collect information from the researchers, we send the email blast to university departments calling for research submissions. The department reach out to their professors, researchers, and forward the submission to us. We usually get between three to five submissions per issue. The studies submitted are often three months old or older since they are published. The second is Japanese peer team. When a release request is sent to the Japanese peer team and the researcher indicates that he or she wants, to, wants an English version, the Japanese peer team forward this request to the international team then we will write about the yeah, peer in English. The third is direct request from the researchers. The professors we worked with before uh, through UNHU uh, update, they request us uh, about writing the peer, uh, the writing uh, peer service by international peers office. The fourth is alert. We get info on studies by HU researchers who alerts that use the keyword Hiroshima University through Google alerts and the daily completion of mentions via Asian research news. There are five ways we spread words about our research. The first one is newswires. 
we post the release on the three new flyers, ULEC Alert, Alpha Galileo, and Asia Research News. The second is media outreach. We pitch the release directly to the journalists. The third is upload request. We reach out to the reputable sites that aggregate write ups on the specific fields. The fourth one is newsletter magazine submissions. We also select one research to submit QS quarterly magazine QSGN. We also submit one release related to the Americas to JSPS San Francisco's newsletter. It usually published three to times per year. And the fifth one is SNS. We also share the release on UHU's SNS. And this is an example of what we do through Alert. Before the international PR team interviewed me as a researcher about my research and education about midwifery in Africa. And they wrote about a story and sent it to you like alert when they called for a story about higher education. And the you like alert picked our story and published on their website. Other people noticed, noticed the story and one example is that this forum asked me to present today. Another organization, Push Campaign, also picked up my story and published on their website and Twitter. And the word spread to wider audience. So for international PR, it is important for researchers to provide information to the PR team and the PR team will have a good writer to write a story for general audience to understand what researchers do. I believe our members are doing great about writing stories. So what we need to do more is to let all researchers in our university know the importance of international PR. We are still trying to do a better job. And if you have any other good ideas, we are open to try a new thing. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Shimpaka-san, for the wonderful insight. Um, so let's see, we have a few uh, minutes. We can ask a question uh, from the community. Please feel free to write any questions that you have in the chat box. In the meantime, can you explain about Hiroshima University's SDG uh, initiative a bit? Um, in Hiroshima University, we mm -hmm. collect information about um, what researchers do related to SDGs, and we put those information uh, to the uh, website according to SDGs categories. So uh, anyone who are interested can go to the website and look, our, look for our web the research uh, based on uh, the SDGs categories. And we also uh, send those information to the university impact ranking, and they uh, awarded us as one of the top 100 in the world. Thank you. And uh, yeah, because it's very interesting how much Japan is focused on SDGs and uh, it's it's so much of a focus in many different air branches of Japan. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what are some of the ways that you monitor the effectiveness of your communications? So can you repeat the question? Sure. What are some of the ways that you can you are monitoring the effectiveness of your communications? Um, it is uh, not very easy to monitor the effect of the science communication. Um, what we do, uh, for example, is we are uh, uh, monitoring uh, the alert from the Google uh, alert and the other means of the uh, alert that say uni Hiroshima University and see how we um, made the uh, media alert uh, that things can go to wider audience. 
um, if there is any other good monitoring system, uh, we are eager to know. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely our community maybe have some more ideas that they can share. Uh, let's go to, a, let's take one more question for you. So, aside from disseminating Hiroshima University's research to a broader academic community, how does the university also reach out to other stakeholders, like research beneficiaries? Uh, research. Different yeah. re research beneficiaries, like different uh, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Usually what we do is a uh, uh, communication through media uh, and that media are not limited to uh, science community uh, like SNS or website. Those means can be accessible to any other entities, uh, stakeholders. So uh, we are not limited to communication with uh, science community. Great. That answering your question? Yes. Uh, and we, we actually have to go to the next speaker, but we have quite a few questions. If you have time, we can uh, please look at our chat and maybe you can answer in our, in our chat. Sure. Thank you so much, Shimpi-san, for your time and sharing your insights all from Hiroshima University with us today. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for listening to me. Um, as you've heard, I come from 360 Info, but before I was at 360 Info, I was working with Nature uh, Custom Communications or Research Communications, whatever the group is called. At this moment in time, it might have changed its name. Um, and before then, I was working for the ABC, the Australian, <clears throat> excuse me, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, as a journalist and editor in both of those locations, I've worked in print magazines, I've worked online, I've done social media, I've even done a tiny bit of television. Um, so where I am now is the uh, is 360 Info. And what I wanted to talk to, about today is the fact that news has always been and will always be a loss making business. Um, this is a, a little slide here of the uh, this is just an Australian some Australian statistics, but in fact these statistics are common across the world. I have found them for other um, for other regions, but I've just stuck with the Australian ones here. Basically, news is actually quite a, a recent phenomenon. Newspapers they sort of arose in in the probably the sixteen hundreds uh, after the printing press got going, but then they really hit their straps after the Second World War, and they matured into the form that we knew them until the internet was invented. And of course, when the internet was invented, these massively successful businesses suddenly started losing all of their revenues. Um, up until the internet was invented, they were subsidised by the classifieds. Basically, you know, if you wanted to sell a set of jousting sticks, you would put it on in an, an ad in the newspaper and somebody would see the ad and they would ring up and say, how much for the jousting sticks? And since they, since that's, the internet was invented, people could put those ads onto different platforms. So things like cars.com or, you know, housing.com were selling cars and houses instead of the newspaper. And so they lost a lot of their revenue. Uh, about 82% of their revenue previously came from advertising and they have lost that revenue. And that revenue has not been replaced by um, digital advertising. The online ads just haven't been as successful as the previous classified ads were. And even those uh, newspapers that kept their classified sections and turned them into some sort of digital product, there's simply not the same revenues seen in those digital um, classifieds as there was in the paper classifieds. So newspapers have lost their revenue. And because this was um, the, this basically subsidised journalism. So now journalism is being exposed for what it always has been, which is running at a loss. Um, 
so they've tried various models ever since then they've tried you know paywalling things they've tried online advertising they've tried doing subscriber drives uh the the uh, the guardian and the conversation even try rattling the tin they try charity um things to try and get people involved but it's just not been quite as uh much revenue as there had been previously for for journalism and of course we need journalism i don't think i'm telling anyone here anything new when i say that we need journalism uh for a functioning democracy we need to have a free and fair press we need to be able to question those people in power we need to um bring other voices into the public conversation about policy and about the direction of the nation or in fact the world and so we need those kinds of questioning voices in the media that everybody can have access to to hold the people in power to account and to just point to different directions different ways of doing things that can be done so all of which is to say we've arrived at a situation here that we have um, cash-strapped newsrooms who uh, got no money at all <laughs> very much these days. We still have a very big need for journalism. And, um, and so there's not those two things coming together. Meanwhile, there is a vast amount of money tied up in academia. Whoops, here we go. Oh, that's about uh, the purpose of journalism, why we actually need journalism. So meanwhile, there's a vast amount of knowledge tied up in academia. So in the universities, there are people who are subject matter experts. They know everything about a particular field or a particular niche, but they're often very good at communicating with each other through the scientific literature, but they're often not quite so good at communicating with the wider public. And there's a range of reasons for that is, you know, you could be cynical and say, well, they're not paid to publish in, in the mainstream media, whereas they their citation count goes up when they publish in journals. And so there is that incentive to publish in journals, but not the mainstream media. Um, also, people are often inexpert at, at public, uh, communicating with the mainstream media. Academics are often very good at writing journal articles. They get years and years of training in doing that, but they have not had the years and years of training that journalists have in communicating in plain language to a mainstream media audience. And so 360 was conceived as a way of tying those two things together. So what it basically is, is... And, and, you know, it's an experiment. It's an experiment in, in presenting news in a different way, in presenting academic ideas in a different way. And, you know, we're hoping it's going to work. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, we've only been around for a year. We launched very quietly in November last year, and we've been gradually building up awareness ever since. I'm quite surprised to hear you say that we that people have heard of us because um, one of the things we do is we take contributions from academics and uh, we have a co-production model where journalists and editors like me work with the academics to present the information in a way that's going to be appealing to the mainstream media. And then we send it out via a newswire. So we're not actually a destination website. Some of the listeners today might be familiar with the conversation, which is uh, similar in some ways. And in fact, our founder, Andrew Jaspin, also founded the conversation. Um, but the conversation acts as a destination website. So they spend a lot of time and energy bringing people to that website to try and attract them. Um, I should probably just stop talking soon, so I'll, I'll wind up quickly. Um, but we don't do breaking news. We don't follow the um, the news cycle, the 24-hour news cycle. We're not slave to that. We loosely follow the sustainable development goals to try and uh, direct our ideas. We co-write the pieces with the academics, and then everything we do is distributed via Creative Commons 4.0 license, so it's free for people to use in any way that they would like, provided that they provide attribution for the academic and for 360 info. The idea is that we'll counter misinformation and we'll tap into the expertise that is in academia. I should stop talking, so I'll wrap up there. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Pleasure. Uh, okay, so we have two questions and we have one or two minutes. Uh, let's go to questions. So, 
so last few years we have been dealing with COVID and we, did you see any difference of behavior of 316 for readers before and after, after COVID, like post COVID period? I didn't personally because I was working in two different jobs at that time. So the behavior of, of the mainstream media audience has not been necessarily under my uh, consistent attention for media to be able to do a before and after. But speaking with colleagues at Nature, I know that they noticed a huge increase in science interest in science and reading of nature during the COVID pandemic, which makes enormous amounts of sense because nature, of course, being such an authoritative journal um, and an authoritative news source is a, a great um, place for people to go for information about a, an emerging pandemic. Yeah, that's very interesting. And the next question is also something I was wondering. Uh, so, you mentioned that 360 Info doesn't follow the, the 24 hour news cycle. So can you explain a li little bit more about how you choose the topics and the stories that you are covering since it's not part of the news cycle? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that we like to do is we have a reference panel of academics that we go to and we speak with them about what's happening in their fields and what's interesting and what's emerging. And so we take our cues from those academics as to what is likely to be uh, um, something that's going to be uh, making news headlines at some point in the not too distant future and then we filter that with our journalist brains on thinking well that's all well and good for you as an expert in this particular area but are people going to be interested and so we filter those ideas uh, through the journalist lens to then try and uh, create a short list of, of topics that we're going to be covering and that's why I, I said that we're loosely aligned with the SDGs is because we realize that there's a lot of overlap between what we're wanting to cover and what the SDGs cover. And so they're things like global inequality, poverty, climate change, food security, those sorts of topics uh, have huge appeal. Um, they're of global appeal, but they're not necessarily uh, like the hot thing right now that's in the news. There's something that's an ongoing story. It's unfolding slowly and it's just something that uh, we'll always keep coming back to over and over again as more and more evidence on the topic becomes available. Great. Uh, Sarah, there are a few other questions on the chat, but we are running out of time. And I would encourage if you can answer these questions on the chat would be great. Um, sure. So, Look, yeah. There's one there from David Swinbanks. Hi, David. Um, I, I, a quick answer to that one, which is that 360, uh, he asked uh, how 360 Info is financed. It's sponsored by Monash University at the moment uh, in our startup phase. And then we will be reaching out to universities all around the world asking for sponsorship to keep it going because we think it's a really good um, association for universities to have uh, to be associating themselves with transparent, free, fair, and accurate information. All right, so thank you very much for the invitation to talk to a science communication forum, uh, which is not something that I'm used to doing as a researcher. So today I'm going to cover my journey in becoming proficient in science communication as someone who is not trained in it at all, as one of the earlier speakers all already mentioned. So I'm going to walk through some of the tips that I've learned through becoming proficient in communicating with the general public. So as background, my research is on dead fishes, the dead fishes in this modified title on the title slide. So I study fossil fishes from the last 450 million years, which mostly look like this. So they mostly look crushed. To the untrained eye, they don't look like very much. Some of them look more fishy than others. And these are the good fossils. These are the fossils that I put in a mosaic to display to other people to show, oh, look at all this fish diversity. But I can use these in a number of ways to unlock things that might be more interesting to the general public. So I can look at the early history of life, the things that led to modern biodiversity, our own ancestors in their earliest phases 400 million years ago, how they lived, what they ate, what they did, and of course, how they died. So I can study things like the effects of climate change on biodiversity, where I can study the effects of mass extinction, what lived, what died, what made it through. And then finally, I can study how modern ecological communities came together, how modern ecology was formed, why do we have so much biodiversity in reefs, what happens when that biodiversity is challenged, 
and set a baseline that we can use to look at future challenges. So that all sounds really interesting, but the main problem that as a researcher who's not trained, the main problem that I have, especially since my field is actually very small with about a dozen labs worldwide, is the question of why should anyone else care? What I'm doing is at its core, very esoteric. It's basic research. It doesn't have real translational possibilities at its face. It seems like what it's been referred to as stamp collecting. So my challenge has been, why should anyone care? How do I bring the gifts of fossil fishes to other people? How do I deliver the truth, um, the history, our shared history to the general public so that they can appreciate the scientific research so that they can share in the results? And so to talk about how I came across these skills and what I developed, I need to go back to the beginning. So my very first paper as a PhD student. So the raw data for that paper looked pretty much like this. So these are a lot of plots and graphs um, from large biodiversity databases of fossil fishes, what lived where, what lived when, what environments they live in, how did diversity change through time. And then there's all this very technical writing that goes into the paper. So the thing is that the scientific audience is not actually that different from the general audience. We have to tell them what the meaning of our research is. Why should it be published? Why should it be shared? What, what is the impact of this? And so my PhD advisor, Mike Coates at the University of Chicago, told me that basically to tell the story of research of our paper, we have three factors. The first question is, what did we know? So what is the general baseline of knowledge? Because we all stand on the shoulders of giants. So what is the state of the art in science? What did we learn from doing this exercise? Why is this science worth doing among all the other potential things that we could have done? And how does it change things? What is the take home message from this research? And so even in writing a scientific paper, these questions are important. This is how we come up with the title, the title that summarizes what the finding is. And in this case, all of those numbers came together to discover a new mass extinction 360 million years ago at the end of the Devonian, which led to the rise of all the modern biodiversity that we have today, including our own ancestors, the tetrapods. And then that's also summarized in the abstracts. The abstract spells out, here's where things stood, here's what we did, here's where things stand now, here are the implications. But that's great for a technical audience. It may be buried behind a paywall for the general public. And so the first, this was the first experience I had in trying to share these findings with a general audience through the press. So to do that, we had to step back even further. What is the view from 10,000 meters? What is sort of the global overview of why this matters? And so I worked with press officers at the University of Chicago, which are like some of the people that are here today. Um, to try to develop how to convey this message to non-experts, people who have no scientific training whatsoever, who may be reading a newspaper. And so this was a very interesting experience. There were quotes that were pulled out. We got to see a draft. Are these quotes what I mean to say? Is there another way of putting this? And so I worked closely with the press officer, Robert Mitchum at the University of Chicago to put out a press release with no expectations whatsoever. And from this experience, what I learned is that another important skill to have is to iterate your message in practice. Did the person you were talking to get it? What did other science journalists do with that press release? How did they spin the results? How did they try to get it to make more sense to audiences based on their skills? And so it was interesting to watch as this press release sort of snowballed into different coverage in different venues, as I was contacted by other journalists to do interviews, which I had never done before, and got instant feedback about my answers and got new perspectives about my own research that I had spent months on. So I wanted, so after this experience, I wanted to take my skills further. I wanted to try out new audiences and new ways of conveying information, especially as papers on this subject kept coming out. And now there were multiple threads of research that had to be brought together. And so to put myself out there, I applied to be a TED fellow, which is, um, a specific fellowship that TED does in order to take people from top fields and give them communication training, to teach them how to give a talk and convey a message very briefly. And so my first TED talk in 2017 was about this mass extinction and these dead fishes and trying to convey both with humor and in a very brief way, which was a four month process involving feedback from all kinds of different people what I had actually found, what the meaning of this mass extinction was that set the stage for modern biodiversity. 
But in that process, what I learned is that a lot of the core concepts that I had taken for granted, like the history of life on Earth or the kinds of biodiversity that we have or other major events that had been discovered over the last 200 years in my field were not well known among the general public. And so that taught me that even sharing the basics of our science is still necessary, no matter how many other outlets are out there, there may be a new perspective that finally connects. And so that was the root of my second TED talk about my field, what paleontology is, and the history of life in the last 500 million years, including mass extinctions, winners and losers, presented in a not so wooden way, as you can see the use of the meme right here. So this is another um, example of how you can use humor. The other thing that I learned from Ted is that you need to help your audience visualize that you can say terms that they may not be familiar with. You can assume that they have the core concepts, but you really need to paint a picture for them. It's not enough to have the narrative. So you can use words. You can describe the early fishes. You can describe the fossils. You can paint a picture for them of what the setting is in this very different time and place that they have no experience of. And that time and place can be at the level of cellular mechanics inside the human body, or it can be at the level of a 400 million year old ecosystem and its inhabitants, something that no human will ever experience. And so I work a lot now with paleo artists to create visuals and with graphic designers to create visuals that really convey the main message. So here, for example, I'm showing differences in size in a post-extinction um, ecosystem. There can be paintings that this really conveys the core of this is a mass extinction that killed 97% of all life in a way that even writing out those words ne not necessarily would. And we can use other things like this was an Instagram um, set of slides that Ted created based on my talk script just by reading the words themselves. So I didn't actually see this until the day, but I think conveys very well the message that I was trying to send out. And then finally, I've also been involved in animations through Ted Ed of animating basic principles that are actually really hard to explain in writing. And so the take home from this is that you should hone your skills as a researcher. You should keep putting yourself out there, keep trying to communicate with the general public, see what sticks and what doesn't, and trust your expertise that you've come a long way and learned a lot in your experience as a researcher that should be shared with the general public. And so I hope these tips can be used by other people because the take home is that we should also have more scientists that are doing this kind of thing and putting themselves out there. So thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Laura, for that fascinating insight and your experience with TED. And so talking about TED experience, I was, I was also wondering, and, and there's a question uh, related to this. Do you have, what, what can you actually take the, from your tech experience into an academic talk at a conference? Because if you look at all the conference talks, they're very bit more uh, driven, result driven, driven background driven and so on, and which is completely different from a tech experience. Right, so I, I think that's where the know your audience comes from. So you can always apply the skills in visually conveying information on your slides can always be improved and get the point across in a really concrete way. And so it is a translatable skill because speaking skills are cumulative and you can always be better at it. And scientists are different from other people. They do appreciate the easier it is for them to take in information, the more they appreciate it. And actually, as it turns out that my TED experience also helped me in grant writing. So if you have a scientist from different fields that may not be um, proficient in the background of your own field, it teaches you how to walk them through, walk them through from the broadest level of that, what do we already know, to what you plan to do and why it has impacts both in your field and then in other fields as well, spreading outwards to the general public. Okay. And, and there's also, if you, if you look at scientists in academia, uh, a lot of them have to do some sort of communication for getting some grants. And right. the bigger the grant, you had to do like a presentation and uh, present to a review board and so on. Has, have you experienced sort of bringing, uh, in the sense like, have you used your TED experience to, to for a grant or to get some sort of money? Right, so the, the biggest grant that I got was um, an NSF career award, which is the big early career grant. And I did use my TED experience for that because it taught me about visualization. 
that sometimes it's better to have a really nice figure that illustrates the flow through what you're planning to do and shows your data and shows what it what it means and to use sort of more general language in case you do have reviewers that aren't familiar with the nuts and bolts of your research. And so it's all about, again, bringing the audience in and knowing your audience. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. So uh, I work for the Mechanical Biology Institute in the International University of Singapore. I make illustrations for the researchers, for the papers, um, but a lot of times I also make illustrations for uh, posters, illustrations for the journals, or even like future articles that our team writes. Uh, I, I make the artwork for them. So um, I will, later on, I will be sharing uh, actually a uh, resource that I created that. that teaches a bit about how to, to put ideas on the paper, uh, especially in terms of how to put scientific ideas uh, and draw them on the paper. Uh, that is one of the challenges that, that we have. But I, here in my talk, I want to talk about another challenge. I want to qu quickly brief you to a few figures that I made for, for scientific journals. Uh, they could also be the core illustration for a magazine. So like an editorial uh, illustration, I would call it, okay? And you have uh, these uh, scientific uh, journals with this like very like, almost like a children's book kind of illustration. It's everyone in school. Actually, the, the research that it represents is totally different. And you have some that starts to, to bring a bit uh, the, the, the research on it. So if, if you look at the, the one on the right, you have uh, sort of a, a graphene layer here. So it, it sort of talk about graphene. And then you start to have a illustration that is a bit more accurate. Uh, I represent a drosophila, there is a drosophila, it's a drosophila egg, it's a drosophila pupa, right? But it's still, uh, there is still a bit of an artistic uh, representation of it. No one is grinding drosophila in the lab, right? So that is not representing what the research is. Uh, but of course, that there is the idea of representing mechanics through cogs, and so this illustration represents the title of the, the issue of the journal, which is mechanics of development, right? And you have figures, illustrations that are more, uh, spe more specific, they are more accurate, they are more like, almost like representing uh, the science itself, right? And the one on the left is the inside of the cell, uh, represents some molecules in the cell, and the one on the right. Is, is representing a, a microscopy method that uh, our team is developing in your know, institute, right? So it's almost like if I could take a photo of the cell, a photo of this microscopy method and put it in the, in the journal, it would work equally well. It's almost the same, right? So I have all this range of uh, different types of, of artwork, right? My, the, the question that I have, the, the, the main challenge is like how, what is dictating this range of like things that can go very whimsical to things that need, need to be very specific, very accurate, uh, very perfect representation of the topic itself, right? So in, in my experience and seeing other artists in other fields talking about it, uh, what that means is like we, when we think about creating a piece of art or story, visual storytelling, right? We think about the audience, the medium, and the story itself, right? And that guides your storytelling for your branding, your marketing, your journalism, your scientific illustration, your movie, whatsoever, right? But guiding out of this, directing this, right? There is this figure called the art director, which it, it's not necessarily the, the job. I not I don't have an art director, but I deal with people that guide my work. They they direct my work. So the art director here is, is the person that determines all of this. The person that tells me, do this or me this way, change the color, right? So the challenge in making a, a figure, right? Is like, are you dealing with a good art director? Right? Is the person directing me a good art director, right? Especially in my case, I, but in different cases, you may deal with, you may have an art director in your team, or you may just deal with your editor, or maybe you are working directly with a scientist, right? So all of them usually, especially the scientists, right? They are not trained to be our directors, yet they, they do our direct us. They are direct me, right? So there are different types of 
sort of art directors that I, I will face, right? There are those that are actually, they don't do any direction. They just give it back to me, right? So it's, like, it's up to you, right? And uh, they come to me and say, Diego, this is my story. This is my research. Can you make an illustration for, for the journal cover? This is, to me, is very good because I have enough experience to, to feel free to make the art. So I will go crazy and I will do all sorts of different kind of artwork for, for this kind of person. And they will be fine with it, right? And usually the journal accepts it because I know what the journal wants. And then I usually get the code accepted, right? There will be those that they will give you some guidance, they will give you some direction, but they still give you the, the freedom to, to, to produce your, the work, right? So they will come to me and say, okay, this is my story, you know, uh, I have, I'm doing research on graphene, uh, can you represent it? Can you show graphene in your illustrations? Okay, can. I'm gonna make a few concepts, I'm gonna show you these concepts, and you can choose one of them. So people like this, right, I, 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 I have freedom to, to be creative. I make a few different variations, which are these on the left side, give to the research and the research asks, okay, can you develop this one? I, I like this city, the idea of the city. And I develop it. She didn't tell me how to make the city, how to make the houses, how to make anything. She gave me the freedom to do that, right? She, she was just concerned about, okay, the graphene needs to look in a certain way because you know, my research is on graphene and that is it. So it gave me uh, a certain level of freedom, artistic freedom to, to make it. And of course, there will be those that will just treat me or the artist as the hands that are clicking on the mouse using the keyboard, right? Like they, they, are, they are the micromanagers, right? You, you do as I, told, as I tell you to do, right? So they'll come to me and say, oh, this is my story. You need to, to make it in this way. This is a protein, it's in this angle. You need to have this color, blah, 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 right? It's pretty much like, the only reason they don't do it is because they don't know how to do it. So, but they, they make it through me, right? And I, they, oh, they overlook a lot of, of things. So this kind of, the, the third type of a director, right? Is the kind of person that demands accuracy and precision, scientific accuracy and scientific precision, which is not uh, our responsible in your work, right? Uh, they make you uh, do, exactly what they ask you, right? They're micromanaging me. Right? And overall, they will disregard all the elements of uh, good storytelling. So they will not care about the audience because they're asking me to, to make very specific, specific things, very accurate things without thinking about those, do the audience need that or not, right? Is this making the story more interesting? Can I learn more from that or not, right? So the, the real challenge is not uh, between science and art, it's like, how do you work with a bad artistic director, right? So can you say no to this kind of person? Can, can you control this kind of person? If yes, good, if no, then there are other things you can do. Uh, I just try to manage the way they manage me. So sometimes when I am making some piece, I, I, I on propose make a certain mistake, expecting them to correct that. Because I know I will spend less time doing that than something else that they want me to do. Hi. A lot of times it's about managing myself. I need to manage my temper. I need to always remember I need to be professional. I need to, I am doing work for someone else, it's not for myself. So just do it, get done with it, and move on to the next project. Right? So this is the, to me, the, the challenge of making uh, scientific illustrations, dealing with people that uh, are not trained to be artists and directors, but behave like one. Right? So, it's also challenging to, to find out when are you collaborating with the artist, with the scientist, or with the board, your board, whatever, and then I'm just serving that person, right? But anyways, uh, the job is dynamic, that you know, we need to be open and professional to both situations. And I, that is the message I had to say. Thank you, Diego. We actually, uh, I mean, this is quite interesting. Uh, uh, personally, I'm quite interested in science and art. And at my institution, we have a, a science art residency running. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is also always a challenge to bring in this artistic approach in science. And because it's relevant for 
not just for uh, to convey for different audiences, even for grant proposals. Yeah, really, really useful. So we are running out of time, but maybe you can answer in a very, very one or two sentence this one question you have. In your experience, which type of art director, uh, which which type of art director scientist do you encounter more? Oh, I, I encountered the other three of them. Um, I was happy to say that that there is a is a equal proportion of the of the three types. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Diego, for your time and sharing your insight with us. Uh, if you can, please stick around and join the uh, conversation on chat. Thanks. Okay.